All right. Um, so here I am with Mike Morris guy. Um, Mike just Morasky. Oh, Morasky. Thank you. Yeah. Mike Morasky. Um, doing just a small, quick interview of some specific questions that my friends asked, but, um, yeah, just thought it would be good to, uh, give the answers to anyone who not, uh, wants to know them. So I'll pass it off to Mike now. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Anytime an uh, opportunity comes up to talk about TF2, I'm happy to do it. Um, my name is Mike Morasky. I am a composer and audio artist, programmer, all of the above at uh, Valve Software for almost 20 years, I guess, 18, going on 19, I think, right now. Um, yeah, that's the gist of it. That's crazy. All right, cool. Let's start. Um, how did you initially start working with Valve? Was it an available opening? Did they reach out to you? Were you recommended, et cetera? I, um, I worked at a place in San Francisco in like the mid nineties called Protozoa. It was an animation studio. And I worked with a, a young guy named Bay Rate at the time. And we became really good friends um, and worked together for years there doing some really interesting stuff. He, then went on to be one of the early people signing on to Lord of the Rings in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And he kind of helped recruit me down there to work on those films. Um, I was animating at the time. I wasn't, I did audio work, but it was mostly um, just in support of the projects that I was working on. Um, and when I went down to New Zealand, it was purely for animation um, mm -hmm. purposes. And, uh, and then when he, I left New Zealand after a couple of years and ended up, up back in the Bay Area working on some films. And when he left New Zealand, he kind of went on this quest to do some kind of new technology for animation and landed at Valve doing the SFM. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were always, we're good friends and so we're always in close contact. And he had been trying to recruit me to work on that project. Um, and at the time I was pretty happy with what I was doing um, and didn't really want to necessarily go to games because uh, I was working on big films for animation. Um, but then the more I talked to him about it and the more I kind of looked at my career at the time, I decided I wanted to switch back to audio and music. And, um, and so uh, long story short, eventually uh, it worked out that, that, uh, like after a, a huge amount of um, like interviews and testing and stuff mm -hmm. that uh, that Valve was a, a good destination for me. So um, they hired me uh, at that point. And that, that was after like, you know, a year and a half of conversations. And I did some work for them um, on, you know, as a contractor and, um, but it was basically just through his connection, really. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. Um, now getting into more specific uh, pieces, uh, there were a lot of questions revolving around Medic, uh, two in particular, but first I just want to ask, what was the general thought process behind that piece? Did you have any specific inspirations? Um, well, you know, uh, that, that one, I mean, there's a bunch of different pieces in there and some mm -hmm. of the, some of the animation had been temped with music mostly mm -hmm. like towards the end, there was a piece of temp music in there. Um, I don't remember specifically. I do remember that I changed up sort of how the music functioned through the whole first part. Um, in fact, pretty much the whole thing really ultimately, but, um, but the first part, like I really uh, changed sort of the, the structure and where the music played and what it did because we were we had all these goals like to how to keep the animation moving and mm -hmm. and to kind of really hit the funny parts and kind of keep the feel um and also establish like a a personality for the medic mm -hmm. up front you know because he's kind of this german character and um and so uh you know that was sort of the the impetus for those things um but tf2 in general has like this kind of Bible of styles that I have always pulled from. Um, and we established kind of early, there's, you know, kind of garage spy rock, right? There's the rock and roll mm -hmm. component that sometimes bends towards like 50s kind of biker rock, you yeah. know? Um, there, it's like, you know, if you look at um, 
what I call thrift store records from that era. They're usually like compilation records or soundtrack records, um, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a lot of material that's sort of, you know, that kind of rock and roll from the 50s, but is l a little extra sloppy, a little extra aggressive, um, and is usually kind of associated with some biker thing or some cop scenario, that kind of thing. Um, and then this, obviously the spy rock from the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of... Um, the the lineage of Eastern European music that ends up in a lot of Italian film, um, you know, like Elenio Morricone films, you know, uh, Nino Rota is one of the big composers from that uh, era. Yeah. Um, that, that those those sorts of styles. Um, so it kind of goes back to, um, you know, Klezmer and a lot of that Eastern European source. And so. Um, I'm usually pulling from some of those and then there's some military stuff, you know, the drum, the drum stuff and bongos, kind of some of those tropes, yeah. you know, language straight out of film. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was looking at the medic, especially in that first section, I knew we wanted it to be kind of funny and quirky, but it also needed to have a kind of weird, you know, because what he's doing is pretty gross and weird, really, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really leaned on the sort of the more Eastern European vibe. Um, also because he is German and ostensibly mm -hmm. kind of has some slightly problematic um, concepts about medicine, you know? Um, yeah. And so I kind of leaned into that for that section, I recall. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, and then the latter part, um, you know, the from basically from when he comes out, you know, through the door and there's the choir, um, mm -hmm. that stuff was all, um, was kind of a, a, a semi adaptation and then radical replacement of the temp music that was there. And because mm -hmm. the, it had been temp to um, Orff's Carmina Burana, which is a really mm -hmm. famous piece of, you know, choir music that's used mm -hmm. in tons of films. And I mean, it's, it's way too familiar and famous. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, I, I, I leaned into the, the, uh, the, the choir part right at the beginning, kind of, it was sort of this dire situation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then, um, I found that, you know, going back to kind of the spy rock kind of garage rock and like nineties garage rock mm -hmm. style version of spy rock, um, was just way more powerful to present him as, you know, cause each of these, videos ostensibly are kind of giving you the personality of the character and they have to be aspirational to some degree and yeah. powerful like they're all kind of quirky and kind of dumb a little mm -hmm. bit they're, they're yeah. a little broken they're all <laughs> of them are a little something wrong with them um, yeah which is all on purpose you know um so i always have something you know like there's some instrument that's out of tune or some some way to kind of represent them as being a little quirky and, and broken usually um but then but then there's always some point at which they're also pretty aspirational and have some musical element that's kind of powerful and you know giving them um, some juice and so that's that's what i ended up you know just the way he um i think as i recall the way he kind of spreads his leg and stands with you know the the health gun or whatever yeah. it's called it's been a long time <laughs> Um, you know, it just looked like he's about to play guitar to me. And so Ooh. I was like, God, I wonder if that would work right here. And, you know, cause before it had been this, you know, this classical dark choir. And mm -hmm. so, um, I switched over that and it was just, you know, it just worked right away. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that was sort of it, you know? Yeah. And it provides such a good contrast with the angelic opera singing and then straight into this intense, um like guitar in the back it's very it works perfectly um but um the sax solo I wanted to talk about that as well the saxophone solo that we hear at the end was that's just to sort of up the ante um and add more intensity to both the trailer and just the character of medic in general yeah there I was um looking for you know I hadn't I, I knew I needed to do something big right there, but I hadn't, when we were in the studio, I hadn't really figured it out entirely. Um, mm -hmm. I had some ideas and sax solo was one of them. And also the player who I was using at the time, I knew could really do that kind of playing really mm -hmm. well. Um, and so I, uh, um, 
you know, I basically, it was just something I tried and it kind of worked almost right away. Mm -hmm. um, so, sometimes that happens, um, you know, more often not in linear material like that. I can kind of really see it and, and, and hear it in my head, what, mm -hmm. what I need to, to accomplish. And then in the studio, it's just a matter of getting the, the right material. Um, but in that case, uh, I kind of knew that I needed something like just writing a, like having an orchestra, like really build right there. I'm sure I could have come up with some way to do it. Um, but it would have been harder to kind of sell the, that, that crazy idea of, you know, a doctor climbing a pile of bodies that he had just yeah. created, you know, it's kind of a really, yeah, it's a troublesome, it's a troublesome concept <laughs> for him. And that it's also triumphant all at the same time. It's, yeah. You know, kind of a quirky, quirky thing to do. And so I kind of knew that, uh, by, you know, I played in um, a noise rock band for a long time, and I understand the use of sort of abrasive material, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and yet also that that can also, oddly abrasive material can also be really triumphant at times mm -hmm. too, which is a, is a weird juxtaposition of concepts. Yeah. Um, and so in that particular case, I was kind of like, I think if I can get him the sax player to kind of go crazy and then at the end bring uh, i'll bring it all together yes. and sort of bring in the um like kind of harken back to the kind of dorky choir you know the because the, yeah. the choir kind of goes super dorky you know it's very major and and ridiculous and then mm -hmm. kind of go back to that it keeps it cartoony and um and not too you know, again, it's, I mean, it's video games. So there's, there's some pretty intense violence, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's funny, you know, yeah. TF2 is a funny form of violence. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, Yeah. And uh, just one more thing about Medic, um, the opera singing, do you know what language it's in? Do you know what it translates to? Yeah, it's, it, it's Latin. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote it. And honestly, I don't remember exactly what it is. I know I put it aside somewhere because I was mm -hmm. like, someone's going to, you know, the fans are going to want to know eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I have no idea where it is. I think it's in one of my many, I have piles of notebooks of sheet music and you yes. know, whatnot that come <laughs> from these projects. Um, and I'm sure it's sitting in there somewhere. I wrote it literally the choir walked in and I was like, I hey, hold on a second. You know, I was like Googling, <laughs> uh, you know, Latin translation. It's something along the lines of, you know, medic, save us, we're all dying, you know, mm -hmm. something along those lines. It's, it's sort of a, a like a, a, not a lament, but more like a, you know, a call out to the medic to save them, you know? Yeah. Works perfectly. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, how did the actual recording process of these tracks go being there live in the studio? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it really depends. Um, I, you know, I've done everything from individual single individual players mm -hmm. um, as well as me playing, you know, mm -hmm. um, all the way up to, you know, full 80 piece orchestras. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really kind of depended on the room, uh, what I was trying to get accomplished, how prepared I was. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with, you know, those, some, some of these TF2 things would happen really quickly. I mean, I was mm -hmm. on the SFM team for a long time, but then I transitioned, like I transitioned out of the room and started working on other projects, like around the time of Left 4 Dead 1. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, and then I was always kind of had a dueling role. So I would be super busy working on a game and then, um, you know, the SFM team would be like, oh, okay, we have this, this piece, you know, we're going to release in three days or something. And so, um, uh, so sometimes I go in and be super prepared as you have to be with a lot of players, mm -hmm. you know, um, and sometimes I go and be less prepared. Uh, my engineer always knew to bring a printer, you know, so that, um, you know, and I, I transitioned to a laptop pretty early just mm -hmm. so that I could kind of go in and just plug into a printer and print sheet music out really quickly if I needed to, or sometimes I just scratch it out by hand. Um, and so, so yeah, like, like I said, it, it kind of was a bit of everything. Um, I, when I was working primarily in Seattle, I worked out of this studio called the Avast, which has mm -hmm. a nice big room. And so we could get pretty large ensembles in there. Um, and you know it, it's it's a mix because sometimes 
you know, uh, the more players you you put in a room, the more the 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 greater the requirement for everyone to play well mm-hmm. at the same time. As opposed to if you break it up, you have smaller groups, and it's easier to get three people to play really well all in one go than thirty. But then you end up with the situation where you have these, you know, these layers that aren't, they're not actually playing together mm-hmm. in the same room. So you really have to, um, it, it's more work on uh, my part to kind of make sure that what one group did will work with an, what the other group has done and make sure that the mock-up that I do in advance is, you know, um, sort of, uh, leads to that outcome and i guess that, yeah. whereas you know an orchestra you got to just really pay attention to mm-hmm. every single bit of players and then be like okay n- no and here's why like we got to do it again and you know this this is these people over here are lagging mm-hmm. or maybe you need to hold this note longer or whatever um and so you know it just really really depended yeah cool all right um you mentioned this uh a little uh briefly arranging the tracks for the trailers and short films you did you make the tracks first or after the animation was complete there are a few that happened first which were usually just um pieces that when i was in the studio for whatever reason just kind of happened mm-hmm. um but for the most part the animation happened first mm-hmm. Al- almost always but occasionally um for example, I think um, sometimes it would happen sort of, uh, you know, in tandem. Like I think with the soldier, meet the soldier, uh, mm-hmm. the all that drum stuff was sort of like we're trying to figure out how to make that section work. And I said, well, what if we did a did a drum line, or maybe someone even suggested it. I, you know, it's Val, so who knows whose ideas are mm-hmm. the ideas that are used ultimately, but. Um, but I, I recall kind of putting together something just to say, hey, if we put this in, let's just see. I think the same happened with the the Scout, too, actually, which mm-hmm. is also drums, you know. And so it was yeah. kind of like, hey, if we just put a, you know, a percussion pass in here, will it hold it together enough to kind of sell it? Um, and and so sometimes it goes that way. But most of the time um, they would put the the animation together and sometimes they'd ask like hey do you have something that would work here so um it is it was a mix um but for the most part usually on the bigger pieces the animation was done first and then because i do all the sound design and the Mm -hmm. you know the mix and everything too so um you know eventually it would just come down to like here it is it's done Mm -hmm. Um, um even though then they would always change it but you know yeah Cool. Um, what do you think, uh, what piece do you think is the most influential to the game of Team Fortress 2 and to yourself personally? You know, um, I'd say there's probably, probably the first couple. Um, Team Fortress 2 was the first thing I ever actually released at Valve. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me personally, it was really important. And sort of essential it was that was one of the like we're, you know it's friday we're releasing we're releasing this thing on monday they had a temp track in that they really liked but they couldn't get the license for it or something mm-hmm. um and you know i probably wrote four or five different cues that were just really roughed i just roughed them out mm-hmm. and um and eventually they picked that one um and then i went in the studio and recorded it super fast um i played I think the guitar is all me, but then, you know, a handful of people, you know, played obviously on it. Um, and, uh, and it just, to me, it really typified again, sort of, it had a, not everything, not all the components of the Bible I was talking about, you know, mm-hmm. it had the spy rock and the garage rock and sort of this fifties, sixties, you know, the trumpets kind yeah, of out yeah. of tune. It's, it's, you know, a sharp, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. kind of on purpose. I was really pushing, I always do that. I push the particularly trumpets to kind of have to kind of go hard to get the mm-hmm. sound that I'm after. Um, and so it kind of, again, it had, I remember somebody when I first, when we released it, I went into valve and someone came around a programmer, an old friend who's got perfect pitch. And he was like, that trumpet is 
out of tune. And I was like, well, yeah, it's supposed to be. It's like, <laughs> gives it this feel of kind of, again, kind of brokenness, like kind of quirky, but kind of overly excitedly broken, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is, you know, you know, that's, that's sort of the nature of getting an instrument, pushing an instrument beyond its normal bounds is, you know, it's kind of to get that feel, um, which I also did in Love for Dead, but I went the other direction. Like, mm -hmm. you know, everything's a little flat, you know, things mm -hmm. aren't necessarily in tune there either but uh and then um the that next batch which was danger bridge and out of that session came um mm -hmm. um uh rocket jump launch uh sorry waltz um that kind of really cemented kind of the italian film component mm -hmm. of that bible and so that that those i mean my favorites are uh, who even knows they're also they all have a lot of meaning to me honestly mm -hmm. um you know each and every one of them uh you know like uh uh, uh anyway i don't i don't want i don't want to i'll just I, i'd have to go through and talk about every one of them but those <laughs> those first kind of two sessions to me mm -hmm. really sort of were the ones that kind of locked in, in my mind, what all, all the rest of the pieces would mm -hmm. be based on, you know, not based on those pieces, but based on the concepts that were used there, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, while you can't choose a favorite, was there a specific piece that was not fun at all to compose? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's really not fair question, but... Um, <laughs> I did have a hard time with uh, um, Demo Man's piece, mm -hmm. um, and it was because it was some of the first players. I had, you know, I had a big house fire in San Francisco when I was mm -hmm. move, first moving up to Seattle to work at Valve, and so I, I had to stay in in the Bay Area for an extra like six to eight months or whatever, and so mm -hmm. a lot of the players I was using early on were uh, were hired there, and I knew who I was getting, and and I think I feel like it. The demo man wasn't the first thing I did in Seattle, but it was one of the first times I hired a, a bunch of brass players, and I just didn't know them, and and so I had a hard mm -hmm. time getting um sort of from them what I was after um and and I hadn't really quite hadn't run into that yet um and it was also tight time frame um mm -hmm. and so when you're you know if you have more time you can always just say okay we're done and then bring in other people you know what I mean um but in this particular case I had to get it so it was a little it was just stressful mm. um there was another one like that too and I can't remember which piece it was but the drummer great drummer but just couldn't um, do it in the studio. Just, mm. it was just so painful to, mm. you know, and so that's, you know, the flip side happens too sometimes where you get a player who you're basically asking not a lot of, and they just give so much that it's mm -hmm. just like, oh my God, thank you so much. And that's <laughs> sometimes pieces come out of literally, I'll be like, oh, this, you know, this accordion player is so good. We have to do another piece mm -hmm. and who knows where it'll go or maybe it'll just be a piece for the you know main menu or whatever um um just because they're such good players that i you know and if you have time in the studio um, just kind of do that that sort of stuff yeah um has your synesthesia directly affected any pieces that you've made and if so specific tracks in which its uh influence sticks out the most uh yeah i mean it it affects everything as far as mm -hmm. i can tell um i don't you know it's i do know i kind of i can identify some of the problems in my life that it's caused <laughs> yeah. um yeah it's really made um it made uh, uh ear training harder for me than i think mm. for m most people just because um like i can't help but see this this sort of weird visions when yeah. I hear when I hear music and so if you play let's say you play a minor third like a, a minor third that's like a C to an E flat right I can go I, I might be able to hear it and go okay there's that's a minor third but if you just drop down and do it to A to C like those are two completely different images in my brain mm -hmm. they're not it's not they're not um I don't see like oh a minor third and a minor third I see mm -hmm. like this thing and I see that thing and they're yes. completely different and there's no 
visual relationship between them that mm -hmm. I've been able to discern other than the feel. And that's yeah, the positive yeah. part, which is like, I know how an A minor feels, you know what I mean? Like I know and how it feels different than a C minor. Like those mm -hmm. two things to me are really different. You know, it's not just a minor chord. It's like a, like they're a whole different visual thing. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's definitely challenging and it's been really great to understand finally what it is, you know, kind of through social media, thankfully, mm -hmm. like kind yeah. of realizing other people have neurodiverse um, ways of perceiving not just audio and music, but like visuals and, mm -hmm. and how they think and whatnot. And then and learning about other composers that have the same thing. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it kind of affects everything. Um, the, you know, the, the ending to the medic is a great example where when I said I know what I wanted for the ending, I don't mean like, uh, like I know, like, you know, I didn't see a sheet of music, with, mm -hmm. you know, because I know people who literally they hear music and they see they see a staff with notes yeah. dancing around on it. And by, that's just a billion miles from how my brain works. <laughs> um, but I was like, oh, when I see a visual like that's why linear material works so well for me is I I can, you know, I look, I watch the, the, the footage and then I just go like I can see in my brain an image that represents the music that will go with it, mm -hmm. but there's no actual music there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes there's, I mean, I can hear music in my brain too, um, but it's, it often is like this other weird image that to me has a real direct correlation to the footage and the meaning and the cadence of the footage. Um, and so, um, so that's a perfect example where, you know, I'll end up kind of going, oh, I know exactly what I need in this mm -hmm. ending section, but then I got to find it, right? Yeah, and so yeah. uh, the instrumentation, like all the things contribute to it. It's not like I just need to find the melody or the harmony that goes mm -hmm. there. Sometimes, sometimes that is a key component, depending on what the thing is I'm working on. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, pretty much everything I do is affected in some capacity, especially the things that are um hyper tuned to the style of the thing i'm working on mm -hmm. right like tf2 is a great example like when i found that bible as i call it you know sort of the design bible for tf2 it, it wasn't just because these i mean partially it was references you know it's referential because it is a 60s spy thing mm -hmm. i was like okay there's all these kind of tropes and languages and vocabulary i can use to, to kind of spell out this world but it's also those styles in my brain when i hear them they give me an image that works to the tf2 aesthetic mm -hmm. same thing with portal 2 and left for i mean everything yeah. I work on ends up they all have to like and if they don't it like kind of is like chalk you know fingers on a chalkboard mm -hmm. um, and and when i hear other people's work that doesn't work it can do that to me too i can just be like oh this music's great but man it just doesn't fit mm -hmm. in this context you know and yeah that's very interesting thank you mm -hmm. um okay getting into more visual effects questions did you play a role in the design of eye of soren or were you given a character design and just brought it to fruition um i didn't have anything to do with eye of soren um mm. i think one of my co-workers at valve and obviously at Weta, but I didn't know him at Weta. Um, Jeremy Bennett. Jeremy mm -hmm. Bennett was a, a concept artist and and character designer at Valve for, you know, at least a decade, if not longer. Um, and we worked together a lot. We we're friends. Um, he very probably had a hand in working on the Eye of Sauron. Mm -hmm. um, I think another. Oh, now I'm not going to remember his name. Um, my old brain. But anyway, there was my friend Bay. When he went to Valve, I was not the only person from Weta that he recruited to work at Valve. There was a bunch of other um, artists that came from Valve, or sorry, from Weta to work at Valve who had worked on Lord of the Rings. And one of them, shit, I'm going to remember as soon as this interview is done. <laughs> um, 
but he I know he had had a hand in the animation and the design of of the actual not the not the does not like Jeremy I think would have done paintings of Sauron's eye mm -hmm. I have Sauron but um forget his name uh, he's really great artist uh he like actually implemented that the CG component mm -hmm. and, and the animation of it um I I know that for a fact I wish I could remember his name uh uh like I said, I'll, now it's going to bug me the rest of the time. Um, I worked, I worked in the, um, the massive department. So, mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of, uh, you know, big crowd, like scenes, like battle scenes and, mm -hmm. you know, just anytime there's a lot of characters walking around orcs. And, um, and then I also, because I had been an animation director and worked a lot with motion capture, mm -hmm. I ended up doing a lot of motion capture directing. Um, and so, all the i worked with the um like the stunt uh designer that he was called the sword master um <laughs> and and a couple of his other stunt people to design all the motions for the orcs and the you know all the different species of orcs and the elves and you know all the different the different sort of uh knight factions right from the different um yeah uh uh towns and um and then you know implement design their motion trees which is mm -hmm. right out of video games mm -hmm. um and and then captured them and you know built the built the character because the characters and massive characters kind of function like a video game npc you know mm -hmm. um how that you know animation is is in pieces that you trigger and they blend from one to another that kind of thing um and so uh i did that and and then i also like i said uh directed a bunch of motion capture with the fellowship. So I worked with, mm -hmm. you name it, all the, all the, you know, the you know, Viggo Mortensen and, mm -hmm. you know, Sir Ian McKellen and whatnot, and got wow. to direct them in motion capture, which was uh, really interesting and, and uh, a cool thing. It was a great, great project to work on. It was really hard. It was mm. really, really, you know, I was there pretty early and, uh, and, you know, worked for a couple of years very hard on that project. How was working with visual effects like back in an era where they were still relatively new to filmmakers? Um, I, you know, it was great, actually. I thought it was really uh, fascinating. In general, it was fascinating just because there were it it wasn't it was hard. It was really mm -hmm. hard. But everything was new, like whenever you did something, it no one had kind of done it before, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it I found it really compelling and exciting. And, um, you know, I, I've always been a creative artist of some form or another, but I have always kind of found a, a, a real had a real fascination and um, sort of inspiration when it involves technology in some way that um, is somewhat new. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so in, in that context, it was, it was pretty exciting and fun. And, and there was, you know, you know, I know probably half a dozen people who have Oscars and, you know what I mean? Like you end up with these colleagues who um, you're all there together and you're sort of this, uh, I don't want to make it sound overblown, but you know, you're kind of the select group that are working on this particular film mm -hmm. and making, solving all the problems. And it's a very heady sort of, it can be a very, it could be a very heady sort of situation. And games often feel the same too, mm -hmm. honestly, because it's never, you know, at least at Valve, you know, we're rarely sitting on our hands going, oh, well, we, let's just do the same thing as last time, you know, um, it's always some new thing that we're trying to solve and new, um, you know, ways of expressing and, and creating entertainment and that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I, I, but that period in particular was unique. Like if you, you know, I didn't get to film until um, probably the, or, you know, late nineties, mm -hmm. early two thousands. Um, and, and so, but the, you know, the stuff that was happening before that I was in CG, I was doing animation 
um, but it was mostly for television and some web stuff and whatnot. Um, but uh, but there's just like the characters who were doing that work and you know the people at ILM and you know there was just really it's it was kind of the wild west of of you know and they going to Weta was just incredible like it was just some of the smartest people uh, you know I had ever worked with up to that point and uh, um, and then there you are like okay well who's gonna you, your job is to solve this entire thing yeah. that's gonna end up in this giant three-part epic film you know um, yeah it was was exciting and heady and really hard and we, we worked really 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 hard <laughs> yeah well i'd say it pay off perfectly right, thank you um what is the longest amount of time you've spent on a single specific project visual effect musical piece and what was that project um boy uh you know yeah, you know, most things are kind of these two-year windows for mm -hmm. me. I guess Lord of the Rings. I was there for a couple of years. I didn't. I did pre-production for the entire trilogy, but I didn't. wasn't there to finish the last film and and mm -hmm. a big part of the second film. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, and then I mean, obviously, I've been at Valve for almost twenty years now, but. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but at Valve, I would say prob Alex was like over three years, I think. I mm -hmm. was on Alex. Yeah. Um, Portal 2, I think, was probably more like a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, and the Left 4 Dead series was l over two years, mm -hmm. you know, because I kind of went from the number one to number two directly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but so, yeah, I'd say... Interestingly, Alex is probably the longest I worked on a single project. I guess uh, when, yeah, Dota, Dota 2, I wasn't, that was like mm -hmm. probably a year or so because I was just helping with the tech. Um, and CSGO, CSGO, yeah, it's probably close to a couple of years. So, yeah, Alex is probably, probably it, I would say. Um, I mean, I was in a band for 10 years. You know, so that, you know, and uh, I've been married for uh, almost 20, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I think those count. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I got a 21 year old and a 15 year old kid too. So. Those are... <laughs> <laughs> um, just in general, any tips, words of wisdom, anything to say for those interested in the sound and visual effects industry? Um, You know. If you like, if if you love it, I mean, this is, sounds so like a platitude, but you know, <laughs> if you love it and stick to it and are just act, you know, you're genuinely interested and fascinated, like just keep going. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the main thing is just kind of keep going and do good work. You know, um, there's always people always say that's like, you know, who you know, it's who you know and how lucky you are. And the truth is, is yeah there is luck and there are connections like my friend bay has mm -hmm. connected me twice to two of the biggest you know jobs i've ever had in my life but the reason was is because we had done amazing work together mm -hmm. and you know and that's that's the you know i think that's an important thing that i've noticed i've worked at a lot of studios mm -hmm. you know i've been in a lot of animation studios i've worked in a lot of audio studios i know a lot of musicians and at the end of the day like I gravitate towards people who are doing really, really good work, mm -hmm. right? Like when I think about my friends on Lord of the Rings, they were usually some of the top people and not like, not nepotistically the top people. They were just mm -hmm. the most interesting people doing the most interesting work. And yeah. so I was, I gravitate towards them. And, and likewise, we would, you know, cause we would be like, oh, this is a person that I want helping me solve my problems and I can help them solve their problems. Um, and if, if you do that and you do good work, then guess who, you know, in the long run, the people who are succeeding, you know? Um, yeah. and so how, you know, people is almost more important than who, you know, really at the end of the day. Cause I, and I've heard this said before too, like, um, if you, if you get a chance to, let's say, go meet with Steven Spielberg, right? Like yeah. I, it doesn't matter what you do. Are you a script writer or 
you know, aspiring cameraman, if you don't have like really great work to show for yourself, it's not going to do you a bit of good. Mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. You know, yeah. like maybe if you're his friend's kid or something, you might be <laughs> like, oh yeah, you know, give him the, you know, assistant coffee deliverer job or whatever. <laughs> right? Like, but that's not the thing that's going to get you where you want to go in the long run, you know? Mm. Um, uh, and, and love the work if you can, mm -hmm. you know I mean? Cause if you don't, then it's hard art art and the arts and creative work mm -hmm. is it's not it's not like you know um not that programming's easy but i think it's a it's a nice juxtaposition in a way that there's a lot of artists who end up programming and mm -hmm. programming is is artistic it's like got this there's beautiful ways to express your ideas and the things you're trying to accomplish but at the end of the day you can actually measure like it functions Mm -hmm. and there's ways to measure like say oh, it could function better if it worked this way versus mm -hmm. that way it could be optimized to function faster um and so there are real clear measurements as to whether you've done a good job mm -hmm. with art it just isn't mm -hmm. there's no clear measurement ever yeah um especially music music's kind of worst of all um which and i i like you know i'm you know i old action sports person. So skateboarding, skiing, you know, and the faster, the more aggressive, the better. And so I have always been attracted to certain types of stress and fear. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's, you, you know, you got to love it if you're going to kind of weather the, the, the fear and personal doubt and, you know, and imposter mm -hmm. syndrome and all those things mm -hmm. that go with the arts. The arts are just hard. They're just, they are, they're hard. Um, and, and not in just like the hard working way, like, you know, um, I'm definitely a hard worker, but, uh, it, they're, they're, they're scary a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you got to love it. And then if you love it, you just don't really pay attention to the scariness as much, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and take care of your mental health around it too. If you can. Yes. Yes. You know? Um, <laughs> I, I definitely have failed at that and in many times and have a lot of PTSD just from work stress, which I didn't, mm -hmm. didn't realize until I got therapy, you know, it was like, yeah. Oh yeah. I guess the stress of work can be so extreme that it causes actual PTSD symptoms. Yeah. And so it's, it's all very important to mm -hmm. keep yourself healthy and, you know, and, you know, yes, you can stay up for 24 hours. It, it does work, but you're going to need to get some, you're going to need to like eat well and drink a lot of water and, and sleep, sleep a bunch, a bunch after. after. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was very nice. Um, jumping back to your music with Team Fortress 2, um, the Rocket Jump Waltz stands out to me among your work on Team Fortress 2. It is short, sweet, and simple. But I was wondering if there was anything more behind the song, inspiration, how it came to be, and if anything was uh, planned for the waltz, or if it was just immediately and exactly what it needed to be the second it was done. So Rocket Jump Waltz was done in that second session I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, when I did, uh, what's it called? Um, Danger Bridge. Mm -hmm. And I had brass players come in and a pianist. I can't remember who came first, but I had extra time basically. Mm -hmm. And, and I had not written it. I hadn't, nothing was prepared. Um, but I, so enjoyed working with the people I was working with. And I was, again, I was kind of just starting to come, like my thinking was just starting to come online for sort of this Eastern European, you know, cause Danger Bridge isn't really that, but it is very much a, a like a Italian film mm -hmm. vibe, right? It's got this very yes. yeah. um, clear kind of Italian film nod to it. And so I was there and I had extra time and so it literally was, I think I'm, I probably, I should go through my notes. I mean, I have just stacks of notes and <laughs> I have a terrible habit of like, like, you know, like I have a notepad here, right? There's nothing on here. No. Oh, right. So here's a perfect example, right? Like this is a, a notepad that's like, oh, if I were going to make a note right now, I would write it right here on this. Mm -hmm. But what I'm looking at here 
it has so it has a synth patch i probably just used on the cs counter strike 2 thing i just did mm -hmm. and then it there's something that says uh uh something triple laser so that's portal <laughs> 2 um and the elevator stops at fire level uh, who knows but then rat man <laughs> You know, so it's got a bunch of Portal 2 stuff on it, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I have this terrible habit. I could just have notepads everywhere. And that's literally from, you know, 10 years ago, more. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, somewhere I have, I guarantee you, I have me scratching out the like, you know, here, here's the chord changes. Mm -hmm. in, and I just, I literally just assembled it with the, the pianist. The brass players and then this fantastic um uh clarinetist mm -hmm. who i used on a bunch of tf stuff uh and i'm not gonna remember his name right now <laughs> he moved to new york unfortunately i haven't been able to work with him in a while um mm -hmm. but uh it was very much just like a sort of on the spot thing but you can tell like it was part of like i already knew that the you know ba -da 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 -da, you know that mm -hmm. has that ending yeah. to it but, uh, but there wasn't quite enough time to, like, I literally thought of it and I was like, okay, well, let's just get this length and that'll be enough mm -hmm. to make a statement, but not like, oh, I had no idea that it was going to be so great, honestly. Yeah. And so if I had known, I would have designed something longer um, mm -hmm. or at least had them improvise, you know, mm -hmm. and um, which I, like I say, I do sometimes. Um, I think the version of the uh that that opening um squeeze box piece on the medic mm -hmm. on the on the album is really lengthy right mm -hmm. it's yeah. just because i was like oh well you know on the piece it's like 10 seconds long or something because it yeah. just is that segue but then mm -hmm. i was like oh well i'm gonna have to you know put this in the game at some point and so eventually i i, I you know I got smart and said, well, if even if I don't have something, I just have the chords written. I'll just say like, well, here's the chords. Here's the main melody. Can you just improvise for a bit? And then I go through and cut it up and find the best parts and yeah. arrange it you know, that way. But um, in this case, it was just early, you know, like I said, it was the second session. So I, uh, you know, I, I got something out of it, but it was just what it was. But in some ways too, like you said, it kind of is just perfect. Like, you know, yeah. if I'd made it longer, it might've just, not been as good mm -hmm. yeah thank you and very even, much for that yeah and you can kind of tell it's it's kind of sloppy you know mm -hmm. it, it literally i mean it sounds like you know me scratching it out on the paper it's like okay here you go and um you know so it's the rhythm's really loose which is really appeals to me and again to me that's very much tf2 Right. Yes, absolutely. The yeah. the charm that specifically comes off of Rocket Jump Waltz is indescribable. Oh, great. Yeah. That's very nice of you to say. Of course. Um, what is your latest work? And do you have any uh, projects currently in the making that you can share and talk about? Um, I can't, you know, Valve, I can't really talk about anything. Mm -hmm. We did just release some videos for the Counter-Strike 2 mm -hmm. um, beta yeah. that is now out and, you know, it's fantastic. The team, they really kind of went the extra mile and, you know, cause we we're kind of like, how do we make a Counter-Strike 2? Um, but I think that, cause you can't change, it's Counter-Strike, you kind of can't change yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think they really um, nailed it. Um, and so uh, there will be a little bit of continued work on that, um, which I can say. But I'm not like the lead, um, Emily Ridgway is the lead audio artist on that mm -hmm. team. And she's fantastic and um, has been really great that I, you know, she, I don't have to be that person on that game, you know, mm -hmm. like I once was a very long time ago. Um, and otherwise, I can't really say what I'm gotcha. working on. Um, mm -hmm. I am working on uh, my daughter who's at UCLA is wants to go into film and so i'm working on her student film which uh -huh. we fit we shot together over the summer and so now i'm doing all the audio and composing the music for her which is really fun because it's um it also she kind of it gravitates towards that eastern european thing but it's mm -hmm. quirkier but it is you know so it's kind of been fun to in some ways it's like a little return to tf land you know um, <laughs> what i'm writing for her uh, uh, 
And so, um, yeah, that hopefully I'll, I mean, I need to get that done quickly for her because she needs to use it to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's so lovely. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else that you would like to add or promote or say before we wrap up? No, I mean, nothing really, you know, I, like I said, I love talking about TF2. It's one of my favorite valve games ever. And, um, you know, the more we can keep it alive, the better. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Took the words from my mouth. Thank you so much. You're welcome.